Grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We meditate this day on the readings appointed for the first Sunday in Lent, which you have heard. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. God's Word created everything that is and was. God's Word alone brought all things into existence. Our first parents were privileged to have God speak with them in the Garden of Eden, and they received that Word and lived with it. Then the tempter entered Eden's garden, the place that God had created for his foremost visible creature. And when he came, he brought a different word, another word, a word that would cast doubt on God's word. He offered to make Eve like God. And in so doing, he brought death and destruction to God's heretofore perfect creation. That satanic lie is still alive and well in our day, in our culture, in our community, in our world, and even in the church. It is alive every time the name of God placed upon you in baptism is denied. For you too are constantly being tempted to be your own God. When Jesus was led by the Spirit into the domain of Satan, the wilderness, to be tempted by him, the Father of creation was beginning here to reestablish his reign in his created world and in the hearts and lives of his creatures. He was doing this by defeating the temptations of the tempter. Jesus was led into the wilderness because he is the true Lord and King of creation, Redeemer and Savior of the world. And in those temptations, he defeats them, undoing the garden lie. Adam and Eve were to have dominion over all that God had created. God teaches Adam how he is to live and what he is to do. And Eve learns from her husband. God provides both order and authority in his created world. And he pronounces upon that creation, it was very good. But then the other word, a distorted word, a lie, Satan's word. And the perfect word and world of God is corrupted. In their attempt to become their own God, Adam and his wife are enslaved and made captives to the devil. Desiring to be their own God, the venom of the evil one makes them slaves of sin, no longer fit to rule God's creation. So they are driven from Eden and from the perfect place. The tempter, meantime, proclaims himself both Lord and King. God of this world, he says. He rules with a fist of iron, and no mortal man can break the grip of that one, the one who enslaves and imprisons. Born to die becomes the mantra of those enslaved, and this life of enslavement to sin and Satan and death drives them eternally from the Creator's presence. But then, then the promise you heard. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman. Between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God has spoken his word anew, given his word. The one who delivers, the one who saves will come. And in the fullness of time, God sends forth his Son, your true King. Do you see that his Son, your true King, is sent by the Father to undo Eden? Do you see that Satan's temptations are as real as your own temptations? 
from Satan when they are placed upon Christ. With this exception, he does not sin. Satan crafts his temptations so subtly because they are designed to separate you from the true fear, the true love, and the true trust in your God. Jesus was and is the Son of God in the flesh, and his confrontation with Satan was decisive for us, not as a mere example that we should follow and emulate as we are able, but rather as his victory on your behalf, in your stead, and for your sake. Jesus alone can defeat this and triumph over temptation, sin, and death. And he does this for you and for me and for all mankind. In Christ Jesus, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. His victory over Satan makes possible your repentance. And his victory is the gospel that is given to you that you might believe and receive that forgiveness. It's important to note and understand the way in which Jesus obtains this victory over Satan for you. It is not by a crushing blow of strength, but by submitting to these temptations and defeating them without sin. And because he does that, he takes your place and my place and the place of all his created world. For he lives as you must live, as you ought to have lived but have not. Now through faith, you are enabled to live by the Spirit of God with His Father in concert with His will. He faithfully entrusts Himself, Jesus does, entirely to the word and providence of His Father. It is no mere coincidence that this temptation takes place, as we are told, immediately after the baptism, when God the Father declared him to be his beloved Son, and the Spirit descended visibly upon him. For indeed it is this Spirit who drives Jesus from the waters of his baptism into the wilderness of Satan's domain to be tempted by the devil. This is another great exchange whereby Jesus assumes our place under the law, undergoing all that we face as poor, miserable, tempted sinners. For make no mistake, according to his humanity, Jesus was tempted just like you and I are. So he is tempted so that his victory over this temptation may go to all humanity and become your victory. Just as his cross and resurrection become your forgiveness and your life. It is the word of God to you and concerning you from first to last that determines who and what you are and whose you are and where you stand. This reality of God's truthfulness in his word is contradicted by the first postmodernist who casts doubt on truth, declaring, did God really say that? The world and your own sinful flesh insists that truth is relative and that it's really up to you to decide for yourself what's what and what's true. You must become like a God in your own realm. What's true for one person may not be true for another. And you, after all, are the final arbiter of your truth. Satan demands this from you, this allegiance to this lie. He demands it to be true, even though it is a lie, and you know it to be untrue. But truth does matter. God in his word alone are true, and His Word alone determines truth. His ministry of the Gospel Word and the sacraments given and through Jesus Christ for you is the truth, your truth, God's truth, truth for the world. The devil, the world, and the flesh have nothing to say about truth. Jesus 
says about Satan, he is a liar and the father of lies. And so Satan has nothing to do with truth. Who and what you are and where you stand is who and what and where God says you are and where you stand. That is why his gospel forgives your sins. That is why he declares you to be his child, holy, complete, forgiven. That is why his gospel gives you his life. His gospel fills you with his spirit and makes you his dear child. His gospel is and has the last word for you. Truth is in Christ, in the forgiveness of his cross, and in the resurrection of life everlasting. The gospel is chiefly the word of forgiveness that God speaks to you by name and for you personally, especially through the pastor who proclaims it to you, whether it is then or now. That gospel was poured over you from the baptismal font, spoken to you today in absolution and in sermon. It is read to you in his word and fed to you from this altar that you might have the work of your king to reestablish his father's reign in your heart and in your life. For in the gospel, the true king reminds you that you have been restored to sonship and you know by faith this to be true. Having defeated temptation for you, he makes it possible for you through the Spirit of God to strive and fight against your own temptations. And when you fail, he restores you to sonship again and again through absolution. That is God's truth for you. It was true at your baptism. It was true yesterday. It is true today. And it is true forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.